well, uh, have been collaborating together since 1978, and they've been exhibiting their work internationally since uh, the mid-'80s. Um, it's clear that their work doesn't really fit into any kind of single uh, category, any one discipline, but uh, rather crosses uh, simultaneously the boundaries between sculpture, painting, architecture, furniture. Um, in their, I suppose they call it models, but they're nonsense kind of things, uh, precise things that refer to uh, uh, the, the world of places, structures, places that we inhabit. These uh, constructs are often made in uh, either black, white, or monochrome uh, color, and it's uh, the color of these models and their precision that really resists uh, traditional forms of representation by allowing a space to exist between these objects and uh, the, the conditions that they, that they question. And I think this, this notion of, of questioning uh, seems to be a very important part of uh, the, way in which, uh, the way in which they work. Uh, they have uh, obviously exhibited throughout uh, the world uh, at the British Museum. Um, their work is, uh, um, exists at the Center for British Art, uh, the UK Government Collection, at the Saatchi Collection, and the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, Tate Gallery, the VNA, uh, all hold a uh, uh, collection of their work. Uh, some of their recent exhibitions have been at the Serpentine Gallery, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, Venice Biennale, Royal Academy of Art, the Henry Moore Institute, and the, uh, more recently, the Central House of the Artist in Moscow in the year 2000. Uh, I think also last year, uh, Langhans and Bell uh, won a commission uh, for the Sunderland Gateway uh, project, which I hope we'll get to see somehow as part of uh, tonight's uh, presentation. We're also fortunate that uh, uh, Richard Cork is here, and uh, um, there will be, in a sense, a, a kind of discussion, conversation going on first before we have also um, a discussion with uh, all of us. Uh, I'm sure uh, you're all familiar with uh, Richard's work. He's the chief art critic of the Times. Uh, he did uh, art history at Cambridge and uh, also completed his doctorate there in uh, the late 70s. Uh, one of his uh, early books, uh, which uh, was also, I think, the subject of his PhD. Uh, it was on uh, vorticism and was awarded the John Llewellyn Rees Prize in 1976. Uh, he then went on to write such books as The Social Role of Art in 1979, Art Beyond the Gallery, uh, David Bomberg in 1987, um, a number of other books, but more recently, uh, he has completed a, a book on Jacob Epstein in 1999, and he's working on a his recent history of British sculpture in the 20th century. Would you please welcome Langlands, Bell, and uh, Richard Cork. Thank you very much. Um, I think in attempting to find a way in to your work, um, I'm struck really by the singularity of it. The fact that although you're very well known and you exhibited a lot and many people are familiar with what you've done, at the same time it's actually quite difficult to place you. Um, that's already been touched on in the introduction in fact, but I just want to emphasize the almost the slipperiness, almost the, uh, <laughs> the determined way in which you've tried to evade any categorization, so that although you're called artists, and although I see you as part of the context of contemporary art, um, in a way you're kind of out on your own, aren't you? Um, you're dealing with things that I can't think of any other artist um, comes very near you in terms of your, your issues and your subject matter. Um, and I think also, although that you've been um, included in, in exhibitions like Sensation at the Royal Academy uh, in the late 1990s, the uh, show based on the collection formed by Charles Saatchi, and of course 
Saatchi has been a fairly assiduous purchaser of your work over the years. Although you were in sensation, I wouldn't really say that uh, you were centrally uh, located even within that show. Um, and when one says the word sensation, one doesn't immediately think of, of your work. So there is this sort of feeling that you're operating always at a, um, at a kind of tangent. And maybe I could start by asking you both um, whether you feel that yourself, whether it's a deliberate policy or whether it just happens because of what you're interested in doing. Um, <coughs> it's not a, it's not a de deliberate policy. Um, although we do, we do feel that at times, yes. Um, really, we, we just follow our own interests and, uh, and the things that excite us and the things that we love. And um, that's what's led us uh, along this path. And we, we haven't sort of consciously um, sought to um, just you know, to sort of separate um, the course that uh, we're following or anything like that. Um, but, you know, you're right, on occasion we, you know, we don't, often it seems as though um, um, the sort of contemporary art world is, is made up of various gangs or groups, and we don't, uh, we don't sort of feel as though we're in a gang, certainly. Uh, you both graduated from, from Middlesex Polytechnic in 1980. I think that's where you met, wasn't it, uh, as it students? Is, yeah. That's right, yes. So you must have uh, well, not only met there, uh, but decided that um, um, both on a personal and a professional <coughs> level your, your interests coincided. What was it, do you think, as students that um, made you realize you had some kind of common thread, some sort of um, um, central fascination with a particular thing? I think, I think the first thing that we made together made us realise that we could actually work together. We built two kitchens side by side. Um, and originally what do you mean, as, as students? As students, um, as an installation, if you like. Um, and we were going to, originally, I was going to build the old half of the kitchen and Ben was going to build the new kitchen. But as it happened, we ended up collaborating and making both kitchens together. So you entered into this space which was full of rusty, time-worn objects. Um, there was a table, there was a chair, there was um, rusty cutlery, there was the smell of old fat, um, rotten floorboards and an old window that you looked through and there was a brand new kitchen but it was a mirror image of the old and everything was brand new and sparkling and shiny but you couldn't actually enter this space at all. <coughs> Yes, and at that time, uh, these kind of installations were not called installations, they were called environments. And uh, we, we'd been students uh, on the same course for about a year by the time we made this piece. Um, and um, we sort of got to know each other a bit. We didn't actually know each other that well, but we were just talking um, about making a, a work. We were both sort of fascinated by um, abandoned buildings and that kind of thing, just because it was interesting to explore them and uh, to go through piles of rubbish, really. <laughs> and, uh, and we yeah, used rubbish was a key concern around about 1980, wasn't it? <laughs> well, there were a lot more derelict houses a lot than of there sculptors are now. Were, so. A lot of sculptors were scavenging around then, weren't they? Yeah. 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 So, you know, we, 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 we used to explore these abandoned houses full of, um, you know, abandoned artifacts. And, and we were fascinated by them. Um, and so we decided, we just talked about it and thought that we'd make this piece where we would make these two kitchens. And as Nikki said, the two kitchens were sort of mirror, um, mirrors of each other in terms of the positioning. They were furnished um, properly with tables and chairs and shelves and cookers and everything and kind of objects and um, products that you find in a kitchen. Um, and the objects in the new kitchen were no intrinsically uh, no better than the objects in the old kitchen. But you couldn't enter the new kitchen. You could only stand in the old kitchen and, and look through the window into it. Um, and why was the new kitchen unattainable? Well, partly um, from practical reasons, because we decided to, to light it with light uh, from projectors projected through prisms. Mm. 
and we didn't want people to go into it because that would begin to disturb the, the kind of aura of, um, of wonder that we'd created, if you like, with this light. The, the shelves in the new kitchen were made out of glass and mirror, and so the light uh, sort of ran through them and bounced off them. And um, we wanted it to be, you know, to have an element of mystery. Mm. Mm. Well, in that respect, in terms of that and the and the uh, what you describe as the aura of wonder, and certainly the use of light, uh, that sounds like a pretty prophetic work, doesn't it? In terms of what you went on to do afterwards, the unattainability is interesting too to me because um, whatever perhaps sociological comment it might have carried. Um, there's also something about your subsequent work which is strangely uh, remote in a way, isn't it? Kind of removed um, from the immediate experience of seeing a building. Somehow it's a different order of experience, isn't it? It's, uh, it's something that you, you, you take away the kind of visceral impact of going up to a building that's rearing in front of you and you present us instead with a a quite different kind of experience. Can you talk a little about how your approach to that experience of a building evolved? Um, it's difficult to say um, objectively for us, but um, I think you know when we were working with uh, making works like the kitchen and other works around that time, which followed it, um, we were very keen to make works which had brought with them their own kind of context, so that they weren't wholly reliant in immediate terms on the context in which they were being exhibited or viewed or encountered. We were trying to set up a whole situation in which they could be viewed. Um, and in time, I think, you know, maybe we've, in time we, we sort of explored various aspects of it and, you know, we started to move on. And we, in order to survive as uh, students and soon after leaving college, we actually used to uh, restore buildings for people. And um, we started working with, as we got more competent of, of this, we were given plans by people and we had to work to plans. So that was the first time we actually really started to read architectural drawings and to look at buildings in that way. And then we also started to make uh, models um, architects sort of sketch, sketch models for architects um, as a way of purely as earning money but as soon as we did even after we, as soon as we made the first model we realized that it had a very kind of exciting potential um, both formally and aesthetically but also for if you like sort of telling a story somehow and, and I think it, this all sort of happened at the same time and we began to find to look for ways to include this in our work and uh, so that's how it came about. I think speaking. also, <clears throat> I think also that you know, not everyone can read a plan, but everyone can understand a model. So by turning it into three dimensions, you're almost revealing structures which normally aren't seen from that viewpoint. So in a way, we, we were almost discovering as we were making them entire buildings and, and, and viewpoints that you don't normally have when you enter a building. And also. Um, yeah, but that's very true, and I think that's because uh, it's always been very important to us that our work has been accessible um, um, without, you know, that it can be accessible really by, by anybody who, who comes across it, can access it, um, and take some interest in it and get something out of it without sort of specialist knowledge or uh, preparation. Um, but going back to your question, um, the other thing I suppose is that when we started to work with models, because we were working on a different scale and we could refer to specific buildings, um, buildings that we we're all familiar with, um, famous uh, structures, um, we could, by combining them, find, ask questions about how they're connected or how they're connected to us. So I think in a sense it's just a question of scale and we were just widening uh, the context in which we were finding what, in a sense, was still find, found objects. And when we started looking at plans, we would find the plans to Villa La Rotunda or High Point or something like that. And we were fascinated by them. And so we started to combine 
different plans and different buildings in that way and find out what happened when you put them together next to each other. You roam very widely, don't you? I mean, it's difficult to, to say quite where your preference lies in terms of the kind of um, architecture that you choose to concentrate on. Um, but there does seem to be a, a pretty consistent fascination running through the output that you've produced with um, notions of, of, of power and control. I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but I think that quite a few of the structures uh, that you present for our inspection turn out, especially when one digs into them and finds out a bit more. Um, they turn out to be um, highly manipulative in terms of what they do to the people who occupy them. Um, is that one of your central concerns, do you think? Um, I think it's coincidence, <laughs> more, <laughs> more than a concern. Um. I think these things become more apparent when you've actually made the work. Though we are interested in strategic buildings, you know, but we've, we're interested in many groups of buildings as well. We're interested mm -hmm. in architecture as a whole. We're interested in buildings because they're the biggest found objects you find in the city. You know, we're surrounded by architecture and we're both from London and we've grown up with buildings around us, so it became our subject quite naturally. We yeah. loved, you know, as a hobby, we loved exploring buildings. And, you know, you find out so much about people and how they live through buildings and through the furniture that you encounter within them. I think the other thing is that we realise that um, all architecture is strategic. Um, you know, maybe some architecture is more strategic than other architecture, but basically it's all strategic in, um, in a personal sense and the impact it has on our lives. And... Uh, so I think we feel that very strongly, and I think that's inevitable. Um, we have, in the way we've worked over time, we have sort of tended to concentrate in, uh, in phases on different types of building, and we've worked in series. So at different times we've been fascinated by, uh, or we've concentrated on, um, say, political or, uh, architecture, or rather the architecture of political organizations and international political yeah. uh, bodies, mm. or prison architecture, or um, uh, religious architecture, or um, architecture associated with aviation and airports and that kind of thing. Mm. So at different times we've sort of honed in on that and, and concentrated on that and made numerous works in, in a group or in a series, a lot of which, mm. a lot of the works are consciously sort of connected in a way, not in a didactic way, but um, they're linked by the route we've taken by choosing different buildings and or, or different other elements to combine with them. Sometimes they seem almost subversive, your, your, your choice of subject. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of a wonderful piece you did on the, uh, the building that formerly occupied the site of uh, Tate Millbank. Um, it was a penitentiary, wasn't it, in the 19th century? Uh, a rather extraordinary building too, I think. Mm, it's shaped like a, a giant flower. Yes. These amazing sort of radiant petals um, where people are actually segregated according to different, whether you're a debtor or whether you're a, a female or a male or, you know, it's all sort of categorised and very rational. Yeah. And we were sort of struck immediately by just the shape of the plan, which seemed so beautiful, and yet it was a prison, you know. And the irony is both buildings, uh, the art gallery and the prison, um, <laughs> they have quite a lot of quite a lot of links, and in, uh, in some ways, um, you know, both both buildings are particularly that prison because it was a sort of panopticon um, combined with a radial prison, and at that time, um, people were thinking in a very serious way about how prisons should be designed and, and organised and how they would work, and. Um, so the prison, it was then formulated in a very specific way that prison should be about observation and surveillance. And of course an art gallery is also predicated on uh, observation. Um, so both buildings are about, in many ways, about, about looking, containing and observing. Uh, well that's quite a, a crude analogy, but it does, it still works. Um, and also both buildings are in many ways about integrating people uh, socially in, in sort of larger social norms and values and enshrining what society's values are and, and defining them. 
and ensuring that people conform to them. So there are five little banks. Um, and also, um, Mill Bank was the prison from which, um, it was the main prison in London for transporting uh, people to the, the penal colonies and for periods of uh, enforced labor. Uh, and of course, uh, the Tate fortune was built up um, uh, with a lot of uh, plantation labor. I don't know that much about it, but certainly uh, the sugar fortunes were built up with plantation labor in, in the West Indies. So there are quite a lot of links, actually. Yes, and I do think that you're one of these artists who, you know, the more you dig into the work, the more you find out about it, um, the more fascinating it becomes. It's certainly not a case of uh, the kind of work which you see in a gallery and, and after five minutes you're, you're getting bored. I mean, how, how satisfied would you be if um, people simply glanced at your work and saw it I, I don't know, from an aesthetic point of view, rather than finding out about what it actually did represent. I mean, how important is it to you to feel that people understand that it really was the Tate Penitentiary rather than some wonderful um, leaf-like, petal-like Victorian plan? I don't think we'd mind at all. I mean, in a way, that's how, how we started making our work initially. Um, we were fascinated uh, by buildings, and, um, you know, we, you know, you know, we 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 love the subject. We love the material that we work with. We're fascinated by it, and it's a kind of journey of exploration in many ways. And a lot of our works start off with um, they begin with you know our, our attention is just caught by a formal uh, element or a typology or or some other um, attribute of a plan or a building. And it really, it's a journey of investigation and discovery. So, I mean, we don't mind at all if people uh, just view it in that way. That's entirely up to them. Uh, but, you know, nothing, hopefully nothing stays the same or is static, you know, thing. people's interests can change. Another way in which you differ from a lot of contemporary art um, is the aspect of your work which is um, well made. Um, it's, it's extremely well constructed, it's beautifully finished. It must take a long time, I would imagine, to produce. Um, there's something immaculate about it, combined with the way it's displayed as well, upon which you also place a great deal of uh, quite fastidious emphasis. Um, how do you actually go about the process of working? I mean, I'm quite intrigued by the fact that there are two of you at work here. This is pretty rare. I mean, I know we have, uh, thinking off the top of my head, we have Gilbert and George, and we have Jake and Dinos Chapman working together, but um, it's not that common, and most artists would find it intensely difficult, I think, to work with anybody else. So how do you actually go about the process of collaboration, if indeed you think of it as collaboration? I don't know. Yes, we do think of it as a collaboration, yeah. but I think initially it comes from <coughs> sharing the love of the same subject. Um, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about what we're going to do before we actually make it. We often research a lot as well. So we have to both feel happy and right before we make a work, you know, because it's going to live on beyond that time. So we care a lot about making that decision and leading up to that decision. Um, yeah, as Nikki says, you, we, we're continually discussing uh, different things. and. Um, we, if we decide to make a work or try and make a work, and we um, look at the material we have and we gather other material, and uh, although the making of it uh, is very hard work, can be very hard work, and can take quite a long time, um, that's in a sense only a relatively small part of, of the whole thing that we're doing. And once we make the decision, to do it, then basically we, you know, we draw it up and we do what's necessary to, to make it. We just divide the labour between us, and if we need to modify it as we work on it, we do, and we discuss it, and eventually the piece is finished. So the exciting thing is the transformation when it's nearing the end, when you can feel it coming, you know, together, and and, and then you feel very excited. I'm sure that's right. Um, 
And talking of transformation, one of the things that fascinates me about your work is that although it is, as we've said already, to do with um, to do with buildings out there in the real world occupying very much a social and political context very often and it's to do with uh, people usage and all the rest of it. So you root it very much in one sense, but in another sense, when you look at some of the images that you're exhibiting, presenting to us, um, it's almost quite the opposite. It's almost as if you're kind of uh, throwing them up into space and letting them float. Uh, some of the images almost look like kind of planets, uh, oscillating, uh, free-flowing. Um, so that's a very strange kind of double, double thing, isn't it, going on there? Mm. I think buildings have the power to sort of reverberate over time. And yeah. once a building is set in motion, once that plan is there, once that building exists, even if it's demolished, those reverberations sort of continue to affect people you know, if it's a significant building or has had an effect. That's why building is so important, you know, over centuries. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, there are lots of buildings which have been demolished, but uh, which we're aware of and still having influence <coughs> on architecture being built today. Um, I think also, um, you know, it also goes back to this thing of being fascinated by things and trying to in, in some ways, trying to asking if there's a kind of essence or asking how they connect to other things, and in a way, what, part of that sometimes our, our sort of strategy is to isolate them and and, uh, and to kind of look at things, uh, you know, with yeah. with quite a sort of strong stare. Um, that's true. I mean, it's ironic because I was saying earlier that you know we were intent on, you know creating a context or yes. looking at things within the context, but it's, you know, sometimes, yes, uh, we're removing them from the context, but also that's a, it's quite a common strategy in all art, I think, is to relocate elements um, and to reconnect them. Mind you, I think it is actually true to say, isn't it, that it, um, this whole notion of things suspended, things being isolated in a void, uh, things travelling through space does actually link up with your interest in um, air travel. Uh, you can find quite a few of your actually more recent works, I think it's true to say, isn't it? Where you are actually looking at the whole imagery that one is presented with in, in airports. And maybe it's a kind of change in your work, is it? To do with uh, emphasising more the, the notion of um, of words, for example, lit up on big screens, uh, circular forms containing uh, codes for airport destinations, this kind of imagery. In a way, it links up to buildings as well, because it's about sure. a sort of poetry of places as well. Yeah, but it also invites us to kind of, as it were, travel with you through space, doesn't it? We hope so, yeah. It's kind of quite a releasing thing to look at, I think. Um, can you talk a bit about the, the, those airport destination works that you've been doing? I, th I think, um, on, you know, in one way, one, one thing is that we're conscious that um, there's a kind of trajectory, um, you know, where with architecture, and well, certainly one of the things we're envisaging with our, our work, in the sense, is, is um, a kind of network which starts with um, the individual and um, or the group and moves out to the building and the street and the city and um, uh, beyond that to the whole world. So it's a it's a kind of um, uh, kind of a route of expansion, um, you know, a connection which is moving ever sort of outwards, if you like. I think more and more people are, are moving between places and time has collapsed between places and it's much easier to travel. And so people's notions of time, time is being compressed all the time and getting shorter between places in our lifetime. So it is an important subject. And also, um, it's also again a question of um, scale and magnification and moving out. 
uh, along that route. So one can indicate cities with three letters um, in the same, you know, in, 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 in a way it's again another kind of template of circulation or movement or connection. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's where we're very curious about that. I have a feeling that you might be tempted, um, in, particularly in recent years, to actually move into the process of um, designing architectural forms yourself. Um, I know that you're involved at the moment in uh, this extraordinary uh, new development at Paddington Basin um, and in the notion of designing a bridge. How did that come about? Um, we, we were just invited to, there was an opportunity to design a footbridge over the canal by Paddington Basin as part of this new development and we were invited to look at it and um, see if we were interested and we, you know, we thought it was a great opportunity and something we were very interested in doing so we made a proposal and uh, so we're working on this at the moment, uh, we're working with a group of engineers called Atelier One and uh, it's just about to go to planning. At the end of this sequence there are two or three slides of the uh, uh, maquettes for the scheme but what we've done is we've designed a very simple um, structure which is basically a, a spine wall which crosses the canal and suspended off the spine wall is the bridge deck and cantilevered off, off it are access ramps and staircases. So it's a very sort of minimal um, blade, if you like, which crosses the water vertically. And it's, in a way, it's quite, a, it's, it's steel framed, um, clad with glass. And in a way, it's quite, in a sense, quite monumental, but in a sort of transparent kind of way. What do you think that you as, as artists can do uh, with a commission for a footbridge that an architect maybe wouldn't think of doing? Or do you think that, that the result will be more or less indistinguishable from something that an architect would have designed? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, for especially us to, this, to say. Especially it's not in this really context. for us to say, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> be very um. interested to hear if people feel that there is a difference. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it is going to be lit as well at night, and lighting is part of our work as well. Right. We do see yeah. lighting as an important element, especially yes. you know, because it brings out the modelling of something, and we do feel it's important. Yeah, so once it's lit, it'll be more like the kind of thing that you exhibit in the gallery anyway, won't it? It'll be kind of extension of that. In a um, sense, yeah. yeah. It'll be like a light box. But I wouldn't imagine there's much danger of you wanting to encroach permanently on architects' territory. Um, because, uh, as was mentioned actually in the introduction, uh, you recently applied for and won this exciting new commission to, to do a kind of, I say kind of because I am pausing, it's not really a sculpture, although I suppose you could describe it as a kind of enormous. It is an enormous sculpture really, but it's so it's so huge, it almost becomes architecture, doesn't it? it uh, once again, it's, it, it's kind of poised between the two states. And at the moment, at least, it's actually um, sitting on very much a piece of architecture, kind of bridge-like form, which is there already in, in Sunderland. Um, what was it about that commission that, that attracted you to trying to propose something for it. What was it that fired your imagination? Because it's a very dramatic site, isn't mm, it? Well, initially the site we thought was very interesting. Yes. But also visibility has an incredible range of views as you approach it from different different angles from the road and you know, so that really initially and also the bridge itself being this sort of ancient truncated st structure in the middle of nowhere, you know, yes. this vast sort of urban wasteland and very strange. Yes. Yeah. Not that you've tried in any way to replicate um, either the form or the material of the bridge, <coughs> have you? Um, certainly not the material, because your proposal is, is uh, yeah, to I, construct I, a glass sculpture, isn't it? Yeah, our proposal is uh, 
a structure in glass and steel, but it does refer to the site. The site is um, a sandstone uh, Victorian railway viaduct, which has been sort of abandoned. It's just a section of it, which is about 60 metres long, and it's about 18 metres high on a sloping site by the River Weir. And um, it fell out of use about 30 years ago, and it's just been left there and, and got listed about 10 years ago. And um, it's a beautiful sort of monumental um, relic. And uh, the sculpture that we've proposed for it is uh, the, well, the viaduct, of course, is made up of a series of arches which support a deck on which these uh, trains used to run. And we've proposed uh, a, a sort of screen or row of four arches. Uh, but they're flat arches um, made in glass with a steel frame. And they're sort of, I don't know quite how to describe it, the, the columns of the arches, the posts, are set at 45 degree angles off the um, sort of horizontal plane, uh, alter, alternating, and so are the beams. And so they have a, it makes a kind of prismatic um, arrangement of planes. And the idea is that it's actually be made out of semi-transparent uh, mirror, so it will be alternately reflective and transparent. So, so it because change. it's a screen of arches, it does refer to the site, but, mm. but at the same time it's very different. Yeah, and one thing that fascinates me about it is that although when constructed it will be in one sense quite a, a dominant object, I mean it's a, it's a big thing, um, at the same time it, 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 uh, it's not at all oppressive because uh, it is, for one thing, luminous, and it is, for another thing, not uh, conventionally solid in the way that a lot of monumental sculpture is. Was this part of your yeah, thinking? You wanted to get away thing, from uh, yeah. heavy monumentality. Glass is always a material that we've used a lot in our work, and which we like a lot. And um, we discovered, actually, that glass um, in Britain originated first in Sunderland the first glass was actually found there. So it was a sort of a natural material to use as opposed to the brick below. Absolutely. Yeah. We ought also, I think, to talk about furniture because that's another key element in a lot of your installations. Uh, whether it's chairs, whether it's tables, um, whether it's actually kind of curious amalgams of the two. Uh, uh, chairs that seem to extend into space so that they almost become, well, not tables so much as uh, structures in their own right, occupying quite a lot of space sometimes. Um, chairs that sometimes uh, fuse together or become like kind of uh, bipolar images. Uh, there's a lot of concern, isn't there, running through quite a lot of your work over, I think, quite a long period to do with furniture. How did that originate? It originated in these um, found environments um, yes. that we would reconstruct where we'd find abandoned furniture. I think it originated there. But then... Um, furniture sort of mediates between the body and the building and is such a sort of fundamental aspect that it was something that we wanted to develop. You know, mm -hmm. When we first moved to the East End, we were living in the basement of a tenement flat and the only work surface we had was this table. So we started making books on the table, you know, and that was the sort of the beginning. But it is an essential, the table and the chair is, is, is what you start off from, you know, in your space. Yes. And furniture, um, in a way, when you discover furniture in a building, you, it, it records a lot about the way the building is used. So if you go into a room and uh, the room might be empty of people, but um, the way the furniture in the room is arranged will say a lot about how the, the room is normally used. And, and of course that carries on into public buildings, it's very explicit there. <laughs> so um, we've done quite a lot of work where we've looked at that. I mean, that's something that we've been uh, fascinated by. Sometimes they're quite disconcerting, aren't they? I'm, uh, I'm thinking in particular of, of the, the IMF table, uh, the table where the IMF hold their doubtless deeply mm. alarming conferences about the state of uh, <laughs> the negotiating world, table. World economy, exactly. Mm. 
Like something out of Doctor Strange Love, I thought. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We love the shape of the table as well, because it's yes. got such an extraordinary shape. And we I was can well imagine. fascinated yeah. by the fact that it was open at one end and why this was, and was it significant. But then we found out that it was to let the, the lady in with the tea trolley to give the delegates their tea. <laughs> <laughs> Another way in which you're developing is, is to do with, uh, I mean, you've always been interested in installations, but in recent times, you've actually been penetrating space in a more dramatic way, haven't you? Leading elements through round corners, uh, inside tunnels, so you're presenting the viewer with something much more difficult to pin down even than before. I think we're getting more sort of physically involved in the space. You are, aren't and you? And yes. we're quite excited about sort of making transformations of spaces yes. at the moment which you physically enter. So that's another aspect <coughs> we're, which we're developing really right now. And do you think you're getting more, more interested in a tactile experience as well, maybe? Of yeah. actually shoving people up against the, the, the physical actuality of the work that you're producing. Yeah, I think I think in a way we are, yeah. So does that mean you're getting less removed, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> what, and more involved? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? I think when we, when, when we started uh, working together and when we started making um, this work in the, um, say, early, mid-1980s, yeah. um, which was crystallised in this way where we were working with models and furniture that we were making ourselves um, we were very um, determined that it should that it should be non-utilitarian in you know normally utilitarian way so that you know the chairs shouldn't be sat on and the table shouldn't be eaten off or um, or used in that way and that um, everything was uh, you know uh, for contemplation um, only and we were very determined about that and I think in a way we needed to maybe somehow create a certain amount of space around what we were trying to do, or a space in which we could operate so that um, we could think about the structures that we were using and not just um, automatically use them. <laughs> uh, but I think by placing a sort of a glass top on top of the chair and putting a model underneath it, you are subverting the chair. It looks like a normal chair, but you realise that there's a model underneath and that you, you're looking down at this other world, if you mm. like. And sometimes it's the basement of the National Gallery or something. <laughs> really rather surprising. <laughs> that you're well, inviting we people, at least by implication, to sit on. <laughs> and I think often in, in basements of galleries or national institutions, they're the works that you don't normally see. So again, we're trying to sort of reveal the structures to people that you don't normally see, if you like. Yeah. 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 Anyway, maybe we're more more relaxed about it now. <laughs> and, um, and more interested to make things which, which we can all use. So if you're invited by the AA to, to fill the, uh, the corridors and even the, the rooms, even the lecture hall with some gigantic uh, form, you wouldn't necessarily turn it down out of hand. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably time to um, open it out to the audience if anybody wants to join in, if anybody wants to um, contribute their own thoughts to the discussion or ask questions. Yes? I'd like to ask you about your method of relief because when you start Partly, um, 
it was a, it was a sort of question of practicalities. Um, we wanted to initially when we first started working with models, we uh, encased them in furniture, in uh, tables or chairs. But we wanted to uh, also to separate them and just look at the models on their own. Well, that's how we thought about it, and um, we wanted to basically put them on the wall, uh, a bit like pictures. And we had to think of a way of doing that. Um, we want, I, I think, you know, this is something that we did intuitively, but it's, we wanted them to, <laughs> we wanted them to be, if you like, thought of in a certain way, like pictures rather than like architectural models. We wanted people to look at them in that way. Um, and practically speaking, it seemed to us the best way of, of putting the model of the building on the wall and creating a, a kind of neutrality around it. I think it also allowed us to concentrate on the, in a way, on the sort of typology of the, of the building structure, rather than for the building to be seen as um, a model of a building. I think in a way we, we felt we were sort of representing um, the identity. We weren't making a model of the Colosseum. We were saying, this is the Colosseum. Um, you, know, you know, we were representing a, a sign for it. We weren't trying to make a model of, of a piece of architecture. I don't know if that makes any sense. But. Often the links between buildings as well, you know, across time is quite important. And that, that also affects how we display the works or the models in particular. Yes, it was also, yeah, Nikki's quite right. I mean, it's a way that we were able, it allowed us to bring very disparate different buildings together and to put them in a sort of space where they could be linked and within a piece of art and thought about in that way. Um, when, when I first saw them, I thought of them as cartouches or something of the order of um, a stamp or a seal. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I think we were conscious fr from very early on. We thought about um, you know the way that we're imprinted by buildings, um, consciously and unconsciously, um, as we use them at many different levels. Um, just you know, in a sort of uh, physical way, buildings determine how we act in so many ways, uh, where we can go and where we can look. Um, but also they, they imprint us in so many other ways as well, um, in terms of our cultural uh, and our social identities. So uh, we were always conscious of that. I think we, you know, we were aware that we wanted to bring that into it. Did you ever think of moving from the individual building We have made works, you know, which do actually concentrate on whole universes, if you like, whole towns, like If Rare, this work that we made, um, which is based on the Olivetti hilltop town, which is owned by Olivetti, and um, the whole company, you know, it started off as a small village and it's now a vast town, and all your needs are catered for there, you know, there's an art gallery, headquarters buildings, managers housing, and all this workers housing and um, you, need, you need never leave, you know. Um, you can live and die there if you want to. I think corporatism actually is, is a very interesting issue and you see it particularly, you know, in Japan as well where we've visited several times and one is very conscious of it there as well. Isolated examples of, of that, yeah. But it's not, it's an area that we haven't explored really extensively, but we have made works which refer to um, 
which are interested in that aspect, you know, of, of planning a, a sort of urban entity. Corporatism is not going to go away, though, is it? I mean, you think no. that you no. uh, you think that you will become perhaps more involved in the issues raised by that in the future. I think inevitably, you know, one is affected by what's around you. So yes. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure it will have an effect. Yeah. And you certainly do like Japan, don't you, for other reasons? We love um, Japan, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I thought that um, when I was looking through your work, there was something distinctly Japanese about it, in fact. A um, certain kind of economy, a certain kind of love of uh, uh, conciseness. Um, and even this, this sense of something purged and, and very clean cut, which you like, don't you? Um, you could locate that in a Japanese sense as well, maybe. Um, but having said that, of course, uh, the, the Japanese influence has spread through so much Western art, especially during the course of the 20th century, yeah. that you're not alone in that, are you? I mean, no. do, you, do you find yourselves, perhaps, um, when you look at other artists, that you're drawn to that kind of art, the kind of art that may well have been you know, turned on by or um, not especially. I mean, we're, we're conscious that, uh, although we don't know that much about it, um, formally speaking, but we're conscious of the enormous mm. influence um, and uh, the, or the sort of in, and the very big recognition in uh, modernism of of, uh, of Japanese art and architecture. I think they have a different time so scale as well. I think, you know, the history of Japanese building is so different to ours, you know, which is so rooted in history and heritage. There, you know, in, in Tokyo, you know, a building has a, has a maximum life almost of sort of 20 years, which is almost sort of unheard of here. You know, the land prices are so high that they will, you know, destroy that building and build another one in its place. They don't have the same, you know, they have earthquakes there, which also affect you know, their whole way of looking at building. And it's just so different, but so interesting to us to, to look at them. So you have been influenced by, by the whole Japanese I way think subliminally, of yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. I, think, I think we've, we feel um, quite a strong um, personal connection to um, sort of geometric uh, abstraction and design in the 20th century, and, and of course that's been very influenced by uh, by an awareness of Japanese art and architecture. So, yeah, we're aware, you know, we're aware of it also in that way. And also, the Japanese, you know, respond to and aren't afraid of beauty, for instance, and that's that's interesting as well you know, because I feel here probably there is more fear of that, you know. An you artist we, is a um, messy, dirty thing, you know. Oh, you yeah. think we shy away from beauty? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think you're probably yeah. true. Yeah, yeah probably it's actually something relevant. that we're often criticised for, um, or people often refer to. Um. Oh, did they? What do they say? Well, they re uh, people sort of remark um, yeah. that it's, you know, that it's how you described it, you know, that it's often that our work is um, appears purged or detached or. Um, you know, precise, and uh, some people think that art shouldn't be like that. Um, but, <laughs> but actually, you know, we put a lot of love into it as well, and a lot of emotion, so although it might appear that when you enter it, actually it's quite humane. Absolutely, yeah. So basically there are no rules, else art can be what you want it to be. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, um, question a bit about scale and, and mm. possibly a fortuitous or intentional point at which you left the gallery, let's say, and started doing work outside of the gallery. Um, I think, as a, as a trained architect, or whatever, um, seeing that the, the early works um, in part is quite, quite visceral because what you do is you invert the kind of you've mentioned it before, you, by turning it to the side, you invert the, the kind of power 
I don't think it's an entirely different context. I think you have to look at each situation you're in um, as a new experience, as looking at that there and then, really. I mean, that's how we work. We work very intuitively, so our work is evolving, but you know, we're still working in the gallery situation, but we're just trying to take it outside as well. You know, we're trying to do lots of things, actually, at the same time, if you like, because I think you know, we are living in a very diverse world, and um, you know, opportunities arise, and they can be really interesting if you go for them. So, yeah, I think it's a case of you know, um, if you haven't done it, do it. You know, mm. Try and do it. It's, so we, you know, in a sense, we don't know what will happen. But, um, uh, what was the first commission that you got to do something outside? Of well. Um, We've done very little uh, outside the gallery or, you know, the, the Sunderland Commission was the first thing, but it hasn't been built, <laughs> uh, I think. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we, we're talking about the gallery in a fairly loose sense because we've made <coughs> sculpture outside, but I, I suppose in a way it's still sculpture. Um, probably this bridge in Paddington will be the first thing, but it's, again, it's not built yet. It's just going to planning now, so... It's a process, like like art is, you know. <laughs> but I agree. It's. I mean, for us, we do ask ourselves that precisely that question, you know. Um, and we're just as curious about it as you are. Know. <laughs> we don't know what will happen. Does anybody else want to ask a question? I wanted to ask you actually about, uh, you mentioned Ivrea, uh, which was I think the work that was shown in the Sensation exhibition. Um, how did you feel about being included in that really quite particular sort of context? What sort of experience was that for you in terms of the show? Well, I um, think our work isn't sensationalist, well. but we hope that it's quietly sensational. <laughs> <laughs> You had some pretty noisy neighbours in that show. Not literally noisy, but um, visually noisy mm. neighbours. Yeah. yeah, I think that was interesting for us. I mean, yeah. um, I think the emphasis was more on the sensationalist um, aspect of, of work, so it was more louder. Louder work was the emphasis, generally speaking, in sure, that show. But sure. We were yeah. happy to take part and you know to be there. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, to just widen it out, um, I think myself that there's still too much of a division between architecture on the one hand and art on the other, which I, I often find very surprising when you think about what went on during the 20th century and how many attempts there were even by, you know, as it were, extreme modernist architects to, to rid themselves of... Um, of art and artists from their buildings. Um, even that kind of thinking um, uh, exhibited alongside uh, attempts like the Bauhaus to bring things together. Um, so maybe my final question to you would be whether you, um, whether you feel that it's actually a lack that we have nowadays, this lack of uh, of a greater degree of dialogue between 
between the two sides and whether you would like to see much more, even going much beyond discussion, active collaboration between architects on the one hand and artists on the other. Yeah, I think it's exciting, you know, when there's a project. Yeah, or that, that they can develop. be the same people. Yes. I mean, um, I, th I think so. I mean, I think it's clear that um, at times there are certain sort of energies in society and in culture that uh, are very particular. I mean, probably one of the most obvious ones. I mean, the early period of the century was obviously very important in that respect, and especially in uh, the period in Russia soon after the revolution with. Uh, the developments that happened there in architecture and, uh, you know, other visual arts, uh, yes. with the development of constructivism, mm -hmm. and I think we're very conscious of that. Um, um, I think actually architects are becoming less wary of artists, which I think is a good thing, because I think up until about ten years ago there was a real suspicion. People were very, mm. you know, they, they they looked down on artists in a way, and they didn't want to include them. They were sort of tokens. To be added to, whereas now, yeah, you know, they were too much trouble, really. It's absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Now they're thinking actually that you know they can actually work with them. That artists do have something to contribute and can come up and combine. Yeah, but I with think it's often not the architects. Engineers decision. and the developers and decision. and developers. No, but I mean it's a whole it's a whole process <laughs> that you go about together. You know. Yeah. Um, and I think it's more open. I do feel that. I mean, I think it's quite interesting up. at the moment. You know, the the. The, the culture generally at the moment is, um, mm. well, the notion is anyway at the moment is that it's, it's more open, um, you know, the interest of kind of the corporate culture uh, um, and so the development of, uh, well, the interest of corporate culture have converged in theory uh, much more closely recently with the interests of art, um, whether that be art in architecture or in other spheres. And people are not, as Nikki said, so frightened of artists, um, whether they be artists or architects or any other kind of artist. And um, so at the moment, you know, the, the corporate culture believes that they've got something to get out of contemporary art. But, you know, that could change. Um, you know, and at the moment, art is fashionable, galleries are full, you know, like people that. want to look at art a lot, you know, so there has been a swing in that yes. respect. And corporate culture is not necessarily at all interested in the whole notion of, um, of a, a genuine collaboration between architects and artists. Um, as it happens, I was very intrigued yesterday, I went along to a little ceremony at uh, St Mary's Hospital in Paddington. Um, to celebrate the restoration of some murals that Bridget Riley executed there around 12 years ago. Um, as you might imagine, because they were on the walls from floor to ceiling, they'd been bashed quite a lot by hospital traffic one way or another. So the process of restoration was quite extensive, um, but it's been done with great love and care. The people gathered there were all very uh, committed to the whole thing, including the hospital staff. Um, and both Bridget and the architect John Weeks gave little addresses, um, stressing the fact that they had in fact worked together very closely. And John Weeks even went so far as to say that um, he used the verb subsume, not once but twice. <laughs> Uh, to do with uh, what went on between him as architect and uh, Bridget Riley as artist, which actually quite astonished me because I didn't think that um, I didn't think that either architects or artists were particularly interested in in going so far as subsuming nowadays. But there it is. There is one example, probably a pretty unusual one, of that actually having taken place, um, and I was rather intrigued by that. Um, because it seems to me that if that's uh, that if that's possible, um, it's a nice thought that maybe it could happen again sometime. Yeah, I, I mean it, it does happen from time to time, and there are lots of yeah. examples of it. Mm. And uh, I think it's very important to support it when it's possible to do it. Mm. Um, either you know, I think that support and that those initiatives and that support should come from wherever they can come from whether they come from artists or architects or developers or whoever you know, has some influence and some leverage in the, in the situation. 
Well, on that note, I think that's a very good point at which to, um, to end and to thank you both very much for um, dealing with all my with all my questions. Well, thank um, you very well, much. Thank you. thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>